so I think most of you know how to practice meditation. But uh, I will give some simple instructions, and uh, then you can uh, you, you can try something maybe new, maybe you, you know it already. Uh, so we're going to do the shamatha meditation with the support of the breathing. which I think many of you already know how to practice. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we're going to count the breathing up to 21. Uh, we're going to count 21 cycles of breathing. And one cycle of breathing consists of four different uh, stages, four phases of the breath. It's usually, it starts with the out breath, a short pause, in breath and a short pause in and these four phases we, co we count as one and we count up to 21 this will take about three minutes i think and we don't need to uh, try to breathe more slowly because as our mind comes down our breathing will naturally become slower and uh, what we're going, we're going to do 20 minutes of meditation. So what we're going to do, each one of us will be counting up to 21. And when we complete the 21 breathing, then we're going to let go of focusing on the breath and of counting both. And we're just going to maintain this calm abiding state of mind that we have achieved through that for a few seconds, just until the thoughts start to arise again. And then we return to counting the breathing up to 21. So I think each, each one of us, maybe we will do about three cycles of that. And uh, why, I'm, um, why this is important is because breathing is just the support for our meditation. But to let go of the support in between is extremely important because that's, that's actually what, what real meditation is when we don't have a support, when we're just kind of maintaining the calm abiding state of mind and resting in that. So we need to learn uh, to notice, to observe and to rest in that state. And that is actual meditation. We use the breathing just as a support to be able to reach that state. And uh, so we can do the practice together and then you can share if you notice any difference. So. First we just sit and relax. We can take a deep breath and breathe out completely.
How many of you got lost before counting to 21? 20. 20. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that's pretty much focused on them managed to stay throughout the whole meditation. Okay. Uh, I found that really, really helpful at breathing them out. And I think to start with, I was like, oh, oh. oh. And then once you get into it, it becomes a more circular it felt. And that's why the counting also helps to keep the mind focused because if, if we just observe the breathing then we get lost quite, quite quickly and this adds another element so it keeps the mind more focused because we are observing the breathing and then counting on top of it so it's uh, when we are learning how to meditate but also uh, after many years of meditation, still in the beginning of the session, it's good to use this, you know, just to... Uh, it's a very quick method to calm the mind down. If, let's say if we have just 20 minutes to meditate, of uh, uh, meditation time, if we do 21 breathing in the beginning, then the rest will be much more calm and focused. And the four stages are also important, because uh, usually each one of us have, uh, has their own rhythm of breathing, and most of us, don't, it's not very balanced. Either the out breath is longer, and then we breathe out very slowly, and then keep it out, the, the pause out is longer, and then we could quickly breathe in and immediately breathe out again. And then some others breathe in very slowly and keep in for longer and then quickly breathe out and then breathe in again. So if we slowly work on balancing these four stages, it can also help our state of mind. Because uh, those who keep the breath out for too long, it's very easy to get tired and depressed and uh, we, we never have enough energy. Somebody's trying to get in? Or? Yes, and for those of us who, who breathe in longer and keep the, keep the breath in before, uh, for a long time before breathing out, well, what it does, it makes us more short-tempered, kind of. You know, we, we keep too much energy inside, so then every now and then we explode, <laughs> kind of. So, so that's why uh, this kind of meditation also helps to balance our uh, emotions and our state of mind, so it can also be a big help for our meditation. And I think all, each one of us will notice that uh, some imbalance in, in our breathing. And uh, it's not all, all four stages don't need to be the same, you know. It's the out breath and the in breath are same, and then the pause out and pause in are same. Much shorter, obviously. <laughs> uh, so this is something we can slowly work on, and we might uh, notice some difference over time when we practice. Now we come to today's topic, the union of the two truths, which is not a very easy topic to talk about, so I'll try to say a few words about it and then we'll see if it makes any sense or not. Exactly, is the title? Mm, you, you said it just before. Yes. <laughs> like how, how to use everyday life to realize the ultimate truth. Yes. 
So I will try to talk about this uh, topic a little bit. And uh, it is a very important topic because uh, the relative, relative and ultimate truths are kind of uh, the way our, our entire existence is made of, is what our entire existence is made of. And uh, relative truth is everything that we see around us, everything that we perceive, the whole existence, the whole outer world and ourselves and uh, relative truth refers to the way things appear. And the ultimate truth it's, uh, talks about the way things really are, the nature, the essence of things. And, uh, and, these two, uh, and these two truths are not two separate things. They are kind of two aspects of the same thing. The ultimate truth is the ultimate truth of the relative truth. And the relative truth is the relative truth of the ultimate truth. <laughs> and some, sometimes we forget about that, you know. Sometimes we, we get, usually we are, we are too much, we are, usually we are, our 100% of our attention and involvement goes into the relative truth because that's, that's where we live and we don't have very much understanding or experience of the ultimate truth. But then sometimes what also happens is, and I think that's why Cesare chose this, top, chose this topic, is that uh, we get a very good and clear intellectual understanding of the ultimate truth, and we kind of we begin to disregard the relative truth a little bit. We kind of think we are above it, you know, and uh, that's also it's not right because uh, the way to practice dharma, the way to practice meditation, is uh, to practice the union of both truths, the union of the relative truth and ultimate truth. And uh, I think you put this in the description for, the, uh, for this evening's topic also. Uh, it's a quote uh, of Guru Rinpoche, uh, which says, Tawa nam kale tokyan chova bashile ship, which means uh, our view should be as high as the sky, but our, act, our conduct, our activity should be as fine as flower. And uh, uh, that's uh, what is trying. What Guru Rinpoche is trying to say here is that our understanding of the ultimate truth, our understanding of the way that things really are, of the emptiness, of, of the empty nature of everything, of uh, of the way everything is like an illusion, like a manifestation of emptiness. Uh, so our view should be as high as the sky, like as vast as the sky. We, we can our understanding. Uh, we, should, we should have no limits in our understanding. But then, our, uh, our contact should be as fine as flower, means that in our everyday life, we should not think that if we understand what is the ultimate nature of everything, uh, that uh, we should not think that we are already enlightened and that it doesn't matter what we do, how we act, how we treat other people. Uh, we, um, Mainly what it refers here is the finest flower is our consideration of karma, our understanding of karma and our following the law of karma, kind of uh, uh, doing, using any opportunity to do even a small good thing and avoiding even a, even a small uh, negative karma. So uh, that is what this quotation is, uh, is about. And uh, I chose uh, three verses <coughs> from the Mahamudra prayer by the third Karmapa to, uh, to explain this topic, to kind of to, to come around from different sides, and then we will see if it makes any sense. <laughs> and uh, the first uh, verse is about listening, reflecting, and meditation. And uh, the verse reads, Listening to scriptures and reasonings frees us from the obscurations of ignorance. Reflecting on the key instructions vanquishes the darkness of doubt. Meditation's light illuminates the true nature just as it is. May the brilliance of the three kinds of wisdom increase. 
So what this verse is talking about is uh, something very important. It's about what, wis what wisdom actually is. And wisdom is made of three things. It begins with the wisdom of listening, and then this wisdom of listening, kind of hearing and understanding, needs to go deeper. So we need to reflect and contemplate on, on, the, understand, on the intellectual understanding that, that we get. And, uh, and even that is not enough, uh, through the wisdom of contemplation and re reflection, we need to meditate on it and we, we need to come to a real deeper understanding and realization of the meaning that we are studying. And uh, first, the first wisdom, the wisdom that arises from listening, is also very important because without that we cannot come to the second and the third wisdom. We cannot go deeper unless we have an intellectual understanding. But then sometimes uh, we think that intellectual understanding is enough and uh, we kind of leave it at, leave it at that. Um, that's why we need to understand that whatever study that we do, and I think in, this, in your group you're doing lots of study and meaningful discussions on uh, on, on Dharma, and uh, and why we are also practicing here is because this study then needs to become part of our experience. It needs to we need to we need to kind of digest the study and absorb it, and it needs to become uh, it, it needs to be, become part of us, part of our experience, and. Uh, So the example that it says that it gives here is that uh, the meditation of listening, the study, is like a lamp that dispels the obscurations of ignorance. So the first step is very important because it, uh, we work with our ignorance, and then through contemplation, through the wisdom which comes through contemplation, it it completely eliminates the darkness of doubt. That's what the example that it gives here in the verse. So any doubts that we have when we, um, uh, when, we, when we do our studies, then any doubts are dispelled through a deeper contemplation. And then it says, meditation's light illuminates the true nature just as it is. And so the most important thing is meditation, because what, what meditation does, it, um, it reveals our true nature, it reveals our Buddha nature the Buddha nature that is our essence. And only through that we can be completely free of ignorance. And uh, so this verse concludes with the aspiration that made the, made the brilliance of the three kinds of wisdom increase. So, um, I think you, you must have studied and talked a lot about Buddha nature already, but that is uh, that is kind of one of the basic and most important teachings of Buddhism. And uh, many people say that Buddhism is only about bad news, you know, that we always talk about suffering and how everything is bad and difficult and <laughs> samsara is suffering and there's only problems and like that. But actually, you know, uh, the first teaching in Buddhism and the most important teaching, the real introduction to Buddhism is the teachings on, on Buddha nature. Teachings on the fact that each and every sentient beings, uh, in our essence, in our potential, we are exactly the same as the Buddha. The only difference is that the Buddha has realized the uh, realized this essence and potential, and we have not. We have managed to make quite a mess, quite a big mess around it. <laughs> and, uh, we are wandering in samsara because of that. But the good news is that all this mess around it can never corrupt it, can never damage it. Our essence and our nature is always there, is always pure. So when we are practicing meditation, we're not trying to learn something new. We're not trying to, uh, to tra train in something that we don't have. We're not, what we're doing is we're just trying to reveal this nature that is already our essence that we have been quite good at messing, <laughs> making a big mess around it. So that is one of the most important and first teaching of the Buddha. And then based on that, uh, any teaching that we receive, any study that we do, uh, 
does not become negative, does not become depressing, because we know that the suffering is, o- is only relative, that ultimately suffering also does not exist. Ultimately, ultimately we, we just need to find a way to, uh, to be free from suffering. And uh, in connection to that, to this uh, Buddha nature, um, the, there is a quote from one of the most important texts in Buddhism. It's called Julama in Tibetan. Usually in English it's translated as Buddha nature. It's the text on Buddha nature by Maitreya. And uh, it says, nothing whatsoever is to be removed. Not, not the slightest thing is to be added. Truly looking at truth, truth is seen. When seen, this is complete liberation. So uh, what he's saying here is that the na- our nature, our Buddha nature, nothing, we, need to, to, we don't need to remove anything from it. We don't need to add anything to it. We just need to see it. And when, when we see it truly with, with the eyes of wisdom, then that is already complete liberation. So it's not so difficult, is it? (laughs) (laughs) So this is the first verse, and if there is any question about this, maybe we can discuss now, and then I will continue with the second verse that I chose for tonight. Relative truth is the way things appear, kind of. Relative truth is everything that we perceive. All sentient beings, all, uh, all outer, outer world, outer elements, the outer universe, and inner states of mind. So everything is relative truth. Everything, all our experience and all, uh, all the existence. Is that subservient to the ultimate truth? It's, it's connected to the ultimate truth because it's a manifestation of the ultimate truth. So they are both truths. They are both truths, yes. None of them supersedes the other. Well, su- superseding mm, it, it's hard to say because the ultimate truth is the ultimate, right? So it must <laughs> somehow supersede the relative truth, but we live in the relative truth, right? So to understand the ultimate truth, we are also using the relative truth. What is truth there? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> isn't, isn't the relative truth that we're bound by time and isn't that the same? Sorry? You're, in the relative truth, you're also fooled by time. Mm. While in the absolute truth, you understand that time is, is also. Yeah, uh, so truth, yeah, that's a good question actually. Uh, I think we need to have a, st- a study of Madhyamika philosophy. <laughs> we need to have a course uh, of a, a few years of study to really <laughs> come to the definition. But actually, truth means something that is not fake, something that functions, right? So, actually, what is kind of the definition and the basis of the relative truth is the, is the law of karma, which relatively works. Uh, relatively, if we do uh, if we do positive things, we will experience positive results. If we do negative things, we will experience negative results. So that uh, what is um, in that way, a kind of karma is the basis of the relative truth. That's that's why the relative truth manifests the way it does. And uh, what is not truth, the fake. So called um, in, Tibet, uh, in Tibetan, they have uh, what is called the fake truth, kind of the the, f- the fake aspect of reality. Is everything that is not in accordance with the truth, kind of everything that we uh, that we perceive. Um, for example, ev- all the subject subjective perceptions, kind of all the labels that we put on things, which are completely. Illu- not only illusory, but also wrong. Mm-hmm. Trying to, to label things as good and bad as, as, as this or that, which is very subjective. For, for me, something will be beautiful, for somebody else it will be ugly, or whatever, you know? All, all these things are part of 
it's called not uh, it's not true or fake because it's relative it's relative to pers to an individual perception what is true is is a law that kind of that makes everything else function so the truth could be like the reality of you have a thermometer and the one degree yeah. to someone that might fall. Yeah. That's really yeah. Something like that, yes. But that's really maybe if you have a chance you can do some studies. You can ask Ringu Tulku for some advice to, to really get some basic studies of Buddhist philosophy because it can really help our meditation, you know. Otherwise our meditation can be lived vague, you know, we're doing some meditation, we're practicing meditation and we're experiencing something, but we can't really understand it. And then, and if we don't un really understand, then our experience is not very stable, kind of, you know, then we kind of, uh, we can't work on it, we can't continue working on it. So maybe you can think about some, you're already doing some studies, but... Uh, it's important to have kind of a good foundation on logic and philosophy and like that. Mm -hmm. Squeeze it on into a Tuesday. Sure. <laughs> 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 <Go ahead. laughs> have I answered a little bit or not really? I just uh, one gentleman said that. Uh, have a good time function. Yes. As a definition for, for what is relative and what is mm. uh, or he, he, he said uh, what is relative is time function. Yes. What is not relative is beyond time. Also but what you were saying. Yeah. Like bound by impermanence in mm. the right? So it's a time function. Yeah. Yeah, but th time is not the only thing that defines one or the other. Time is also relative. Time is not part of the ultimate truth. Time is just, just one of the laws that functions in the relative truth. So. I'm not confused. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Okay, we, we can talk to you a bit more about it and then we'll see if it becomes a little bit more clear or not. <laughs> so the next verse that I chose, which is also comes from the uh, third Kamapa's aspiration prayer of Mahmudra, uh, is a verse that talks about uh, the path, the path of meditation. And uh, what it's saying is, the two truths, free from the extremes of realism and nihilism, are the reality of the ground. And through the supreme path, the two accumulations, free from the extremes of superimposition and denial, big words, <laughs> the fruition that accomplishes the two benefits, free from the extremes of existence and peace, is attained. May we meet with this Dharma that is flawless and sure. So this verse is very important, and I will explain it slowly, so then I think it will become clear. Uh, because here what is, explained, what is explained is the path of, of practice, the path to awakening, in terms of three uh, levels, the ground, the path, and the fruition. So the, and, uh, so the first line talks about the ground. And the ground is the two truths, free from the extremes of realism, sometimes it's called eternalism, or kind of the extreme of permanence, and the extreme of nihilism, kind of the extreme of non-existence. And uh, this describes uh, what is the ground. And uh, this, is also, this is kind of the, basi the basis of the philosophy of the middle way, the Buddhist Madhyamika philosophy that I mentioned is kind of is the middle path between the two extremes. So here we, we are using the extremes of eternalism, of saying that something, that everything exists eternally, permanently, and the extreme of nihilism, which is saying that nothing exists and nothing matters. Kind of... Um, hmm. 
yeah, so uh, this is kind of, uh, this is trying to ex explain the Buddhist philosophy, also connecting it to some other religions, to other philosophies. Uh, because uh, what the Buddhist philosophy says that uh, nothing is truly or inherently or permanently existent. And uh, this was mainly at the time of the Buddha was meant to refute the beliefs of the Hinduists, uh, the, the Hindu beliefs who are saying that uh, the Atman or the soul is something permanent which goes from life to life without changing at all. And uh, according to Buddhism there is nothing that is permanent, there is nothing that is unchanging. So uh, that is uh, what this view is talking about. And, uh, and then there are also, there were some, already at that time, there were some nihilist schools who were saying that nothing matters and nothing works, that we just live this life and uh, karma doesn't work, there is no past life, there is no future life, like that. Uh, I think in, maybe Cesar, you know, I think even in Greek philosophy there, was, there were some beliefs, yeah, hedonists maybe, or I don't know, yeah, hedonists. hedonists, I think, no? Mm. Sorry? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, so the Buddhist middle way is kind of, uh, is, is be between the two extremes, between the extreme of permanence and nihilism. And uh, the extreme of eternalism, I think the, beli the belief in a creator God also kind of goes a little bit there. <laughs> belief in a, in a permanent and unchanging being, being able to create everything. I think that also a little bit goes into that, uh, into that um, philosophy. And then it's, uh, it's quite interesting if we, uh, if we, ob if we study the different uh, Buddhist schools, uh, they're quite similar to what, uh, to how the science, scientific uh, discovery progressed also, because the lower Buddhist schools, uh, which, which are called the Vaibhashika and Sautantrika schools, what they are saying is that uh, what exists, what, uh, what our existence, what the relative world is made of, is of uh, indivisible particles and indivisible, indivisible moments of consciousness, but mainly what they say is that it's made of indivisible particles. And that is sometimes quite similar to what science is saying, that uh, began saying that the world is made from atoms, which are indivisible, kind of, which are the building blocks of the reality. And then, uh, and then the Buddhist philosophy progresses into a Chittamatra view. Chittamatra means the, the mind only, which says that indivisible particles cannot exist but actually indivisible moments of, of consciousness exist. So what kind of, what this Buddhist school is asserting that the whole reality is created by mind. And that's also a little bit similar to, to how the science developed also, no? Then after they found out that also atoms are not indivisible, they're made of smaller particles, which are made of smaller particles, which are made of smaller particles, and then which, which are made of waves and light and like this, and they could not find any ultimate and smallest building block. And then, uh, and then the Madhyamika or the middle way philosophy is also saying that indivisible moments of consciousness cannot exist because they are also, uh, there's nothing that, that can be indivisible. Everything is made, every moment is made of the past, present and future. And, and then if you go, if you look deeper and deeper and deeper, then again you can't find any moment to, of consciousness to pinpoint. And uh, that's, uh, that's the middle way philosophy, that's what they are asserting. So what uh, the middle way philosophy is saying, that, uh, the, uh, that ultimately there is no building block of the mind and no building block of reality. Ultimately, uh, everything is empty, the way they say, but um, that's one way of saying it. But then relatively, it is, everything is interdependent, everything is connected, everything is functioning relatively according to 
uh, according to different laws which function in the re relative existence. So the ultimate truth talks about the nature of everything, the nature of all sentient beings, of all animate and all inanimate phenomena. And it says that the nature of everything is completely beyond any concepts, beyond any expressions, beyond, uh, beyond any thought and understanding. And, uh, and relatively, how things appear, they appear in all their kind of multiplicity and var variety and uh, in, in many different ways and aspects, but everything appear, appears interdependently. And uh, that's why the union of the tru two truths is saying that um, the two truths are unified from the very beginning. And the way, the way things appear, they, they do not truly exist, but they appear like a reflection in the mirror, like an illusion. Like a, they appear like a manifestation of the ultimate truth. And because they appear like that, because they are like a reflection, like an illusion, they do not fall into the extreme of being permanent or truly existent. But at the same time, because their essence is empty, but they arise interdependently, so they function, they arise, they're, they're visible, we can experience them, and that's why they do not fall into the extreme of nihilism, of, kind of, of being non-existence. And that's a little bit what we're trying to explain when we talk, when we say that the, the, the two truths are in union. In essence, they are empty. In essence, everything is empty, but they, it, it appears interdependently. The empty essence is the ultimate truth. The interdependent appearance is the relative truth. Is it a little bit more clear or more confusing? <laughs> <laughs> Mm, the, so yeah, yeah, the confusion there is, yeah, I don't think that's... Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness, no, no that's why, I yeah. think in English, it just emptiness and nothingness seem to be almost the same thing. Mm, yeah, but that's why we say em emptiness and interdependence are in union, you know, so interdependence is emptiness. Emptiness is interdependence. So mm. once, once we think about interdependent arising of everything, then we know it's not nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's emptiness of inherent existence. Yes, emptiness of some true existence, of, em of, of uh, kind of a real, you know. Uh, that's what shows our, what you were asked what is true and what is fake, you know. Our fake perception of things as being single, inter independent, and uh, kind of. Uh, what? No, no, single and permanent, yes. So when, without, when we don't examine things, things appear as being, as existing, you know, kind of, even if, I, if, if we look at, if we use ourselves, our ego as, exam, as, a, as the example, you know, we always think it's one, you know. We, we, we never thought, ah, I have two egos, or sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. We always have this kind of unexamined perception that our ego is one, and it hasn't, it's not really changing, you know? When, t ten years ago and now, we, we think this, our perception of self, me, is always me. Ten years ago it was me, now it's me. We, we have this kind of perception that it's not changing, and that it's uh, kind of independent of, of other things, that is not the things do not affect it. My, my perception of myself as me is not affected by other things. That's our kind of mistaken perception. And then when we start to examine, we see that it cannot be like that. Nothing can exist in such a way, you know? If reality existed in that way, then everything would be frozen, kind of. Nothing would change if everything existed as in, in, in such a way that, that we think it exists. There would be no place for 
for for any change, for any movement, for for anything. You know, it would be like a frozen permanent reality. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's why it's uh, that's why it's important to kind of to start examining. You know, then we then we then we begin to understand how how things are. So that's why the ground, the ground of the meditation is really to understand this union of the two truths. If we don't have this ground, then we have nothing to build on. If we don't understand the union of emptiness and interdependence, then everything, all our meditation is kind of, is just, kind of, is just relaxing and finding some peace of mind, temporary peace of mind, you know, but we're not going deeper. The point of doing the real point of doing meditation is to be free from, to be free from all our uh, negative mental states and to be completely free from samsara, to become a Buddha. So if we want if we want that, then we have to understand how the ground, what is the ground of all that. If we don't want that, if we are doing meditation just to find some temporary peace of mind, that's also okay. There's nothing wrong with that then we don't need to go very deep into into a depth understanding of philosophy and like that. But before, before Buddhahood, when you've gone past emptiness, the struggle, my struggle is how you use it. On the way, before. How you use mm. meditation. That's what frustrates me. Well, that's yeah, the thing is that meditation is not an intellectual thing, right? Uh, meditation is it can it can be only experienced. That's why we have as the it's the experience of reality. Experience of reality, that's yes. The, that's the key. So first we get kind of first we get some glimpses of experience of reality, which come and go, kind of, you know. But then when it comes to realization, realiza- realization means that this experience becomes stable, that we have actually realized the nature of reality. And the nature of mind, actually, uh, there is there is different paths. Some some realize the, the nature of mind to realize in the nature of reality, and some realize the nature of reality to realize in the nature of mind. Is that the next stage in these three stages? Also, yes, that's about uh, the ground, the path. The path, yes, that's the path, yes. Right. So maybe we can yeah, we can look look at this yes. explanation mm-hmm. and then see. So what it's saying here, yes, through the supreme path, the two, the two accumulations free from the extremes of superimposition and denial. So what he's saying, uh, what he's talking about here is, again, this verse is everything uh, is talking about finding the middle path between the two extremes. So in, during the ground, which we just talked about, was to find the middle path between the extremes of eternalism and nihilism. And here we're talking about the extremes of superimposition and denial. And uh, these are two ways to misunderstand the path, to misunderstand meditation. And uh, superimposition means, superimposition is actually a funny word. Yeah. And the Tibetan word is even more funny, you know. The t- Tibetan word means draw, dog, you know. And draw means a feather. And dog means to put, to add a feather. <laughs> That's the Tibetan word. So actually, you know, you're adding something to something that is already existent, kind of. You're 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 making things up. You're exaggerating, kind of. I think literally it means exaggerating. And then uh, the other one, denial, means kind of uh, denying, to saying that it doesn't exist, that is not true, that it's like this. So it's kind of it's the two uh, the two mistaken understanding understandings. And uh, an example of that is uh, like the superimposition or the exaggeration is to say that ka- that the karma is ultimate truth, because karma is not ultimate truth. Karma is relative truth. If karma was ultimate truth, then it would not be possible to be liberated, because it would be permanent. It would be. It would. Uh, there would be no way to get beyond the karma. And then the. Sorry, just one so, it um, changes, which is from what I speak so far, or emptiness, interdependence, 
then the change function, uh, changes takes place you know, within the interdependence. Does the change function plays or impact in the uh, optim ultimate truth? Does it does it have any function in emptiness? No, it doesn't have a function of emptiness, but it can happen only because of emptiness. Everything can change because it's empty. If it wasn't empty, it couldn't change. If it wasn't empty, it would be permanent. This time. So, ultimate, uh, emptiness is the ultimate. Yes, and which makes the relative possible. I see the empty or not empty. Yeah, so, so now we come so so now the other one the other extreme of denial is to say that karma does not exist at all. You know, so the karma the law of karma exists in a relative world, in, in a relative existence, it exists and functions. To say it's ultimate truth. It's exaggerating, it's not true. To say it doesn't exist at all, it's denial. So it's the other extreme, kind of. So uh, that's what we are talking about. And, uh, and then the path is described as the two accumulations, uh, which, which refers to the accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom. Uh, so all meditations and all practices that we are doing are supposed to work on these two accumulations. Uh, accumulation of merit is kind of, it's again a very specific Buddhist term, but it refers to kind of positive energy. It could be good karma or something to accumulate positivity. And uh, wisdom, wisdom we know, no, no need to explain. And uh, why... Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I, I already explained in the previous word, verse the wisdom of Listening, reflection, and meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so enough explanation. <laughs> and uh, this is actually quite an interesting point because, um, in order for our meditation to really progress, in order for us to for uh, for our meditation to develop, we need both. We need the merit and the wisdom. And uh, that is something that here in the West we are usually quite happy with wisdom, you know. But we see doing doing uh, like good good things and accumulating merit and doing positive activities and I don't know making offering flowers and incense and uh, things like that, you know. We think that's not really necessary because we already have wisdom, you know. So if I just sit and do my meditation, then everything will be fine, right? Uh, so it's, it's kind of important to have kind of a balance between both, because they say it's like two wings of a bird. If, the, if a bird needs to fly, both, both wing, it needs both wings. So if we need to realize wisdom, we also need merit. And merit sometimes is, is explained like that, you know, it's like uh, maybe positivity is a good word or something, you know. If they say, Sometimes if, if you look at a person, you know, and they say, if they say a person lacks merit, it means that everything that, if, if somebody will say, I lack merit, how this will show is that everything I try, I will not manage. Everything will go wrong. I try this, it will go wrong. I try, I try another thing, it will go, go wrong. I try from another way, it will go, it, I will not be able to accomplish, kind of. Uh, with, so merit is kind of something which, makes it possible for, for things to work for us, you know? Maybe it's luck or fortune also, you can say, but I think we, we can notice sometimes, no? The, the harder we work, nothing happens. And then uh, at another time, we don't need to do anything and things just, have, th things just work. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is explained, that, that is the function of marriage, kind of. If we have merit, things will work. In our life, in our... In, in our uh, in our work, in our job, in our family, and, but it also includes our meditation. Also in our meditation, you know, sometimes we try and try and try and nothing happens and we give up, you know. So that's, that's they also say it's kind of a function of merit. And, uh, and the point is we can accumulate more. 
that's why you know when, when we talk um, that's why with uh, practices like uh, when we talk about the mundra practices the, pr the preliminary practices uh, are meant to do that maybe i'll say a few more words about that after uh, how that works as an accumulation of merit and wisdom but i will say a few words after that And then uh, the third line talks about the fruition. Fruition is uh, what we're what we're working for in meditation, and it says the fruition that accomplishes the two benefits, free from the extremes of existence and peace. So this is a big one, <laughs> uh, because uh, what we're saying, two benefits means the benefit of ourselves and benefit of others. Because whenever we are practicing meditation, we start we started with the verses, may all sentient beings have happiness, you know, and and all of that. May all sentient beings be free of suffering. We're not just saying that, you know. This is this is the basic motivation that we have for doing any meditation, for doing any practice. And uh, when when fruition is accomplished, then the two benefits are accomplished naturally. Uh, we are liberated from samsara, that is the benefit of ourselves. But through being liberated from samsara, we can spontaneously benefit many other sentient beings as well. And uh, that's why here it's saying the two benefits, free from the extremes of existence and peace. So uh, this is quite important also uh, to think about. Existence refers to samsara, but peace refers to nirvana. So we want to be free from samsara, but we also want to be free from nirvana. That's an interesting point, right? So do you want to, to attain nirvana or do you want to be free from it? Not sure? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> mm. But that's the thing, you know, uh, because when we talk about nirvana, you know, nirvana usually re refers um, to kind of to a, to a cessation, you know, like usually in, in the Theravada teachings, they describe nirvana as cessation. Cessation meaning you become an arhat, all the negative emotions cease, and you are free from samsara. But you, you kind of remain in this state of cessation. And according to Vajrayana Buddhism, that is not enough, that is not what we're looking for. Because in a state of cessation, it's very good for you. You're, you're on a permanent holiday. You, know? <laughs> you, you have no more problems. You have no more negative states of mind or like that. But you don't do anything good for anybody else. You're kind of stuck in that state of cessation. And uh, what in, according to Tibetan Buddhism, according to Vajrayana Buddhism, what enlightenment is, uh, the technical definition is it's a non-abiding nirvana. What that means is we are not in a state of cessation, completely inactive, and uh, it's, it's kind of, yeah, uh, we're not in a state of non-activity, but we are in a state which spontaneously benefits all sentient beings in any way possible, forever. So that's quite nice, right? <laughs> we don't need to do anything. And uh, we, we still rest in our meditation, and, but the benefit for beings happens naturally and spontaneously. So this is the enlightenment that we are talking about. This is uh, what we are striving for. And that's why we say we want to be free of nirvana as well, because we, we see nirvana as a state of kind of, as a long, as a long holiday. <laughs> Which is not, nothing wrong with, but it doesn't really benefit anybody else. So uh, that's... Uh, that's the definition of it. So that's why we say here, may we meet with this Dharma that is flawless and sure. So kind of may, may, we, uh, may, we, may, we, may we meet with the teachings and instructions which would make it possible for us to avoid any of the two extremes in all stages of our practice and attain the, the final liberation and enlightenment.
So maybe at this point I can say a few words about uh, what, I'm, uh, what the path of meditation consists of, also to explain a little bit about the accumulation of merit and wisdom and like that. And um, so when we practice uh, Mahamudra, what uh, usually the path consists of uh, different preliminary practices and then the different levels of actual practice. And the preliminary practices are divided into common preliminaries and uncommon preliminaries. And the common preliminary practices are four different contemplations which, uh, which make the foundation for us to be able to uh, for us to be able to do meditation and to kind of to continue doing meditation. And uh, the first one of these uh, common preliminaries is the precious human life. I'm sure you've discussed this also here in this group. And uh, what this is saying, was what we are contemplating here is that um, we are trying to see what we have, what we already have. Uh, we're trying to appreciate our life, our ability, our intelligence, our capacity to understand the Dharma so that we can able that, that, that we are able to improve ourselves, to, to work on it. Uh, so this is extremely important because it is turning our mind into something positive. It is we are learning how to appreciate what we have instead of uh, kind of instead of worrying about what we don't have and uh, Wanting to have, wanting to have, and having all these uh, needs and wants and everything. What we're doing here is we're looking at what we have and we're appreciating it. And uh, then after this comes the second contemplation, which is a contemplation about death and impermanence, which is also extremely important uh, because we're not going to have this precious human life forever. Uh, we have to be aware that at one point it's going to end and even before that it's always changing, circumstances are always changing, everything is impermanent. So with that understanding we know that we have no time to waste, that we're not going to practice Dharma when we retire and when, <laughs> when we don't have any more worries and any, anything else to do. So. Uh, impermanence gives this kind of urgency to our practice, that we have to do it and we have to do it now. Not tomorrow, not next week, starting today. <laughs> and then the next, uh, then comes the next contemplation, which, which is the contemplation on karma, on the, uh, on the law of uh, cause and result. And uh, why is that important? It's because then we might think, okay, one day I will die, so what's the point in doing any meditation? What was the point in doing any practice? Uh, but, uh, so that's why we examine how karma works, and that we know that after death, it's not going to end. No. Uh, death doesn't mean the end. Death doesn't mean nothing. After death, uh, our body dies, but our mind goes on to the next life. And what goes on with us to the next life is the karma. It's what we have done in this life. It's the good things we have done in this life and the bad things we have done in this life, which uh, determine what is, what is going to happen to us after we die. So that's why we need to examine the karma. And then comes the fourth contemplation, which is the contemplation of uh, samsara, which means that even... Uh, we might think that if we have lots of good karma, then we will be, then we will have uh, good lives in the future, good future lives, and then everything is fine. Uh, so for that reason, we examine samsara, and we see that no matter where we are in samsara, we're never free from suffering. And uh, we we come to an understanding that really to be free from samsara, we need to be. That, that it's not enough to be in a good place in samsara. We need to be completely free from samsara. So these four contemplations are, uh, are a foundation for us to be able to practice, for us to be able to settle, uh, for us to be able to take time to, the, to do the meditation. And uh, 
Then after this come the four uncommon preliminaries. Uh, how many of you have heard of this before? We yeah, haven't really. Not so much? Okay. Yeah. I thought so. <laughs> well, maybe some people have envisioned it, but we haven't. Probably, okay, not, not as good. Mm. Yeah, so I will not go too much into detail. Uh, these are some practices which are aimed at uh, purification and accumulation. And there are four different practices which we usually accumulate uh, sometimes 100,000 times, <laughs> sometimes 10,000 times, or like that. Uh, but um, what they're meant for is to, uh, to purify negative karma and to accumulate merit and wisdom so that our meditation is going to work. And uh, the first out of the four uncommon preliminaries is, uh, is the practice of refuge. Refuge is actually the gate to Buddhism. It's when we take refuge, we become Buddhists. And uh, in, this, in the first preliminary, what we do is we recite the refuge prayer and we do the prostrations also. Uh, prostration is, is kind of, uh, how, how would you describe it? It's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? You can do 100,000. <laughs> so it's kind of bow, bowing down. <laughs> I made it. You made it. <laughs> you, you got some help. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of the practices that is usually done as a prelimin preliminary practice before we even start to do any shamatha practices of calming the mind or like that. And what it does is, is kind of, um, it purifies the body. That's why we're doing the physical prostrations. Uh, and we are doing also some vis visualizations and recitations. So it is kind of a purification of, uh, of the negative karma, mainly of the body here, and kind of a confirmation of the direction that we want to take in our life, the direction that you, the, the reason that why we are practicing meditation. And then after that comes the second uncommon preliminary, which is the meditation of uh, Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva is uh, a deity in Vajrayana, Vajrayana Buddhism, particularly connected with the aspect of purification. Uh, and here what we're doing is we're reciting the mantra again 100,000 times and, visualize, and visualizing the purification. And here we, it is mainly focusing on the purification of our speech and our mind because we're doing some visualization and we're reciting the mantra. Prostrations are more like the purification of body because we're doing some activity with our, with our, we're using our body. To, to do them. What's the visualization? Sorry? What is the visualization? What you, are you visualizing? You're visualizing Vajrasattva on, uh, on top of our, uh, above your head and visualizing the purifying nectar coming into you and purifying all the negativities and all, all the negative karma, negative emotions, sicknesses, everything. Sounds good. Sounds good? <laughs> <laughs> um, when you say 100,000 times, so you, in one sitting, you No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long mantra. It's a, the you, you do it on the, You do it until you finish. <laughs> you get like a week. A bit more. It's a, the mantra has 100 syllables. So what you're doing is, uh, usually it takes about a month or two if you do nothing else. Oh, Ooh, see? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what was interesting was what the gentleman did. He prostrated as a kind of adoration to something, a kind of uh, 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 obeisance or some sort of worship. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is to whom is that directed? To the Buddha, of course. To Buddha. Yes. Now, Buddha had attained. Uh, emptiness, am I correct? Enlightenment, you can say enlightenment, yeah. Okay. 
emptiness from what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. That's the highest point. So does it mean that at that state of emptiness, we retain our individuality? Mm, the, so it doesn't completely, that's we retain our individuality. Yes, uh, uh, this, um, this is part of what I was saying before about the non-abiding nirvana, you know, that the activities manifest spontaneously. Individuality, not in the sense of that the Buddha has to think, you know, who to help or how to help and like that, uh, but the way these activities for the benefit of beings manifest, they manifest according to the aspirations that he did before he became a Buddha. He made certain aspirations, may I benefit beings like this and like that and like that, uh, while before he was enlightened. And the, the power of these aspirations make it possible that after he's enlightened, this benefit happens spontaneously. Can I, can I, I see in the altar some personalities. Okay. Now, I don't see who's here. Yes, yeah, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> from this point I could see personalities. Okay. That what 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 the gentleman did is he prostrating to those enlightened persons in the order. Also? Is that a kind of recognition for guidance? It is, uh, actually, prostration is a very good antidote for pride, also. For <laughs> pride. <laughs> no, antidote. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, because we don't like to acknowledge, to, to kind of to bow down to anyone, you know. But here we are acknowledging somebody who has attained what we wish to attain. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of making the wish, may I be able to do that, too. So, those enlightened people have attained emptiness. Yes, but they have realized emptiness, you can say. So, they never die. Their physical body can die, you know. Also, the Buddha Shakyamuni, that his physical body died, but his manifestations never finished, you know. They never, in that way, they, they never so die. So, the leaves are. Sorry? They, they never the, die. We know that the physical body is subject to change. But yes. They never die. Yes. So, which means emptiness doesn't necessarily mean that Nothing everything else. is. No, <laughs> that's why, yeah. Em emptiness and interdependence. Emptiness can manifest. So, emptiness means that you still remain where you are uh, at a higher level. But this time you're more enlightened than, in other words, no time in impact. Am I correct? Yes, you could say that. Thank you. So you've got crazy any mental formations or new karma in the same way. So that there's a kind of flame that's gone out, so you're not creating attachments and desire um, towards things to be other than how they are. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we came to the second of the uncommon preliminaries. And then the third one, it's, uh, it's called mandala offering. And what we're doing here is we're visualizing offering the entire universe. The, everything good, everything nice that we can imagine. Every, uh, all the good things, all the, all the precious things, all the beautiful things, all the beneficial things. We are imagining them multiplying them and offering the whole universe. Also that we do 100,000 times. <laughs> so what that is doing, that, that comes to the accumulation of merit. Because what we're doing here is we're creating lots of uh, kind of a positive habit of giving everything. We're creating, uh, we are creating um, an image of abundance. We're creating generosity, uh, kind of uh, Again, we're, who we are offering to, we are offering to the Buddha and to all the enlightened beings. So we are, cre we are making this kind of connection of uh, generosity and offering and positivity and like that. And that is said to, uh, to kind of to bring about the accumulation of merit. So that's, that's what I was talking about before. It's, it's kind of in creating positive circumstances which make our mind more positive also. And through that, 
again, it opens our minds to practice. It opens our minds to meditation. It makes it possible for us uh, to practice and for the practice to, to work and to go well. Is that just by thinking those thoughts? Uh, you can, there is a particular visualization described, and here you're also doing some, uh, you're doing a physical gesture, kind of. Uh, you have a mandala, uh, you have uh, a plate which represents the mandala, and you're offering some precious substances on it, like this, every time. So you do that 100,000 times. And, and your, your arm hurts after a while. <laughs> <laughs> And then comes the fourth uh, uncommon preliminary, which is called Guru Yoga. Uh, so what we're doing here, so now here we were practicing generosity and offering, and with the Guru Yoga, what, what we're asking for, we are, we are asking for blessings and wisdom from already enlightened beings. We're asking them to, uh, to kind of, to, to, to impart their wisdom on us so that we may be able to do the practice. Again, there is a particular visualization, visualization connected with that. Uh, and uh, with this visualization, what, it, what it's saying is we, this is what, uh, this is what it constitutes the accumulation of wisdom. Because what we're doing here, we are opening our mind to the blessings of enlightened beings. And, and these blessings can make our wisdom to come out, our, our wisdom to blossom. Like that. So, so this were, these are the four preliminaries, and this practices mainly uh, uh, the emphasis of these practices is the purification and accumulation. And uh, after this comes the actual practice, the real practice, which is um, first starts with the shamatha, which all of you know. So only now we get there. <laughs> we get the shamatha. And shamatha is, are different practices and different methods which are meant to, uh, to calm the mind down, to calm the mind, to, to achieve a calm abiding state of mind. And we are using different supports, like what we used before, the breathing, you can use the sound, you can use anything, you can use an image, you can use the visualization. And, uh, and I, think, I think you can understand how if we have practiced all these purification practices for months or years, they have made our mind more flexible, more open to remaining calm, to maintaining the calm abiding state of mind. And uh, that's why we're doing all these uh, preparations and preliminary practices as a foundation for, for being able to rest in the calm abiding state of mind. Uh, and then, this is also not the end, this is just the beginning, the come abiding state, the shamatha meditation. Uh, because once we attain, once we learn how to calm the mind down and maintain that come abiding state of mind, it's not enough just to kind of rest in a dull state without thoughts. What we need to do is to find some clarity. We need to look into our mind. So that's where the practices which are called vipassana or special insight. It's called, they're called the insight meditations. And uh, what we're doing is this abiding state of mind that we have achieved, we observe it, we, we examine it, we look at it. We, we kind of identify different aspects of it. We identify the essence of our emotions, the essence of our thoughts, and like this. So uh, it's, it's slightly analytical, but it's analytical in meditation, kind of. It's kind of a deep, deeper analysis, it's not an intellectual exercise. And uh, why, it comes, why it comes after the shamatha is because if our mind is not calm, there's no way that we will be able to see anything in our mind. Yeah, if our mind is in a usual mess of thoughts and emotions and this and that and sounds and forms and, <laughs> and everything, there is no space for us to be able to see, uh, to be able to look at the mind. So that's why we are first learning to calm the mind down, and then we are looking at this mind, examining it. And uh, sometimes uh, the masters they use the expression, "We leave no stones unturned in our mind." Kind of, we examine every every corner of our mind, every aspect, every emotion, every thought, like that. Um, and uh, after that comes the last. A set of practices, and these are really called the nature of mind practices. 
these are the practices when we start when we start to really see and experience the, what is the nature of our mind, because we have managed to uh, to make it calm and we have managed to see the essence of all the events that are happening in our mind. So then we slowly come to experience this Buddha nature that I started with. We, we, we reveal this Buddha nature, we, we, we allow it to function. And uh, this starts usually with some small glimpses of the nature of mind. And then these glimpses kind of slowly develop into experiences. Experiences are also experiences come and go. And then eventually uh, this comes to the complete realization of the nature of mind. And that is called enlightenment or liberation. So this is a little bit what I wanted to talk about today. I hope I didn't cre cause create more confusion. <laughs> but I think that's what you were trying to uh, get at with the title also, no? kind of to see uh, why we need the relative truth to, al to realize the ultimate truth. Yeah. The ultimate truth is the goal, but we can't just get there like that. We need to go go there step by step. Yeah, and like you said at the beginning, um, how we can get stuck into like a intellectualized philosophical idea of mm. emptiness and so on, and um, then like bypass looking at the mind and all of that, you know, yes. and, and dealing with those things that maybe are a bit challenging. Yeah. And dealing with, dealing with our own emotions also, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's a little bit the danger sometimes, you know, we, we are very good at spotting other people's emotions, you know, but our own are fine, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or even really fueling other people's, like, oh, it's all emptiness, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. get over it. <laughs> you, know, you, you see that sometimes, mm, you know. I know, yeah. Yeah, or, or the other extreme, like when, um, well, yeah, we just, we can get too caught in relative and just get stuck in the mud. Mm. Thing, yeah. Know, not, not notice, like, you know, practice, you might, it gets through as well. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, and then after the meditation comes the, the activity also, the action, you know. Uh, action is what, what it refers to our daily life, you know. Because uh, first we need, to, we need to have meditation, we need to have some experience in meditation, and then we need to integrate that into our daily life. It's not enough to be perfectly calm and nice and kind when we are in our meditation room and nobody's bothering us. <laughs> Actually, what we need to do is apply that in our daily life, in every situation, especially in the situations where we feel uncomfortable or when somebody is not nice to us. Sorry, I think I could, I just saw so you know. That is not for now. <laughs> <laughs> <In> the beginning. <laughs> you started already during the meditation. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to give a startling example of just what you were saying. Um, I once belonged to a Buddhist group where the uh, leader was very knowledgeable. Um, and uh, one day, uh, someone, he was an occasional visitor because he didn't live very close to our center, came and uh, he was a regular uh, befriender of uh, people in prison. And you know, I think it was Rochester he would come to. Um, and one day he uh, came to the meeting. He asked, he earnestly asked if uh, one of us could visit someone who had just been, or just about to be released from prison, was going into a, what we call halfway house. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this occasional uh, visitor to our centre, he was a Buddhist. Um, uh, he impressed me a great deal every time he came. His teachings were so down to earth and practical. Uh, and when he said that this um, uh, prisoner who's about to be released was um, a very vulnerable individual, um, I took that completely on board. But um, I, I was, uh, I had a job and I thought, oh, I know people here could visit um, because they don't have uh, jobs and you know, one or two of them are retired and the leader said she would go and visit him. Um, now uh, there was plenty of money for her to 
travel uh, from where she lived, not that far from here, to Rochester. Uh, I know that because uh, I was the uh, financial officer for the group, and I, we had a couple of thousand pounds always in the kitty. Um, on the day uh, she was due to visit, uh, she missed the bus, and she therefore decided, in view of distance, not to go. I'm sorry to say that that prisoner who had just been released committed suicide. And she could have gone. Mm. She could have got a receipt from a taxi. There was plenty of money in the kitty. Um, and it's, um, I'm sure that uh, it created ripples of unrest in the group because uh, you know, that really was um, shocking. Mm, yeah, it's very sad, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's just a big reminder that whenever we, we see an, uh, we, an opportunity to help somebody, we should do it now, not, not, <laughs> not find excuses or whatever not to do it. But yeah, we can always take it as a personal reminder rather, rather than kind of looking out and blaming somebody for doing something, you know. We can take it as a reminder to for us not to, not to do that, not to be like that. But would it be the group's job then to victimise the world? Mm. No, no one did, but, um, <laughs> but... No, but yeah, it's, it's a really good, it's a good remind, reminder, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was interesting, we, also, we just had the Lama visit to our centre last week and uh, one of our members was in hospital. And then I asked that Lama if, if he would mind just stopping by the hospital just to say best wishes to that person, you know? And he said, of course, absolutely no problem, even though he was on holiday, kind of, you know? And, and, and he went there and, and it really made a big difference. That person was so happy. And he gave them a, a gift and then he, he, said, he said some prayers for him and like that. So I think we should all do whatever we can to help those who need us. Yeah, I thought, I, I made these things a little bit complicated today, but I thought it's kind of, uh, I thought it's interesting to talk about the whole path and about the meaning of different yeah. aspects. Yeah. So. I hope I hope it was beneficial. And if, if for some of you it was, was a little bit too much, don't worry at all. <laughs> what, whatever you do and whatever you can do is worth it. And uh, if you're ever inspired to, to to do all the different practices step by step or like that, it's also great. If not, it's also fine. If anybody just wants to practice uh, shamatha or mindfulness or breathing meditation. Even that will make a big difference in our life. So you shouldn't you shouldn't get worried. And you have a great teacher like Cesare here to, to be with you <laughs> every week. Which is very good. Can I just ask a practical question? Sure. So if you're unable to do well the physical prostration death form, so what would be another method? Well the practice is breathing meditation and then it's uh, it's no problem. That that is kind of just the um, the side practice, the main practice is refuge. Yeah. So you, you, you would just sit and recite the refuge prayer and that's it. If you if you physically are un, unable to do the prostrations. And you, can, you can just do it in the chair. Yeah. 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 Or mentally or whatever. Yeah. And we've got some books in the laundry actually. Yeah. So if anyone is interested in finding out more about these four elements of prostration mm. and purification practice, as uh, an introductory book, I really talk about. Mm. You've got a few copies. You've got yeah. a actually, because no one knows what it is about the book. Yeah, it's called an entree. It's not very really, really long. Nice introduction. Yeah. But even the four contemplations, those can be done by anyone. Yeah. And those are really, really good to, to kind of to bring stability to our practice. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes um, some teachers say, you know, before the practice, you, you do them a little bit like every time. Yeah, like every time, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because 
there's nothing wrong with just doing shamatha meditation, you know, but after a while, shamatha is not as easy as it, as, as it's advertised usually, you know. You don't just sit and observe the breath and relax. You know, usually you can do that for a week or like that. And then, uh, and then there will be, you, you, you will start to feel like you have more thoughts and more emotions and you can't sit and you don't want to sit and <laughs> we, kind of, we find all kinds of excuses, you know. And that's why sometimes we use all these different practices to kind of, uh, to, to find a way to, to be able to practice and to build the foundation so that when we sit down then we actually know what we're doing and why we're doing it, you know. Because if we have a very stable foundation of why we're actually doing the practice, then it's much more likely that we'll be able to go through the through all the difficulties that come over the practice. I never trust all those advertisements, you know, they say just come for a meditation course and <laughs> a weekend meditation course and your mind will be calm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> I never had that experience. <laughs> if anybody had it, I'm, I'm very happy for them. <laughs> Usually it's nice the first time you sit and meditate and then the second is already really boring and then the third one <laughs> you can't stop think, planning about <laughs> whatever you have to do after the meditation. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not as simple as uh, as it seems sometimes. That's why we need all these other techniques to be able to keep going. Hmm. As a speak to a friend of that when, when you when you do the prostration, right? So it looks like you're like you said it looks like my worship or you're prostrating to Buddha, which you are on one level. Well, I don't mind what I said at the beginning. The, the, the only difference between the Buddha and ourselves is that the Buddha realizes their Buddha nature or they realize their emptiness. So, prostration is like we call a relative method um, for us to realize our own Buddha nature within. So, outside, it's like an outside form symbol of our Buddha nature that we're prostrating to. So, ultimately, we can connect to our inner Buddha nature. So on an ultimate level, mm-hmm. we're prostrating to our Buddha nature, but symbolically outside is the method, the relative method, mm-hmm. to get the ultimate result, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does make sense, it does. Um, I thought what um, she was also saying was the fact that we are prostrating to purify us first. Also, yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Kind of purification, you know, taking off our ego, I guess that's what yeah. you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that ult- ultimately there's nothing outside. That's the relative truth that we're using as a method, a means, a way to realize the inner ultimate truth of our Buddha nature. Um, and quite often at the end of the practice of the, vis- of the prostration, you visualize. What you're visualizing uh, kind of goes into light and it merges with. Mm. So in the end, you become one, there's no separation. So I think this is important because otherwise. Yeah, it looks it's, like an external worship kind it's of thing. It's like yeah. an external worship and it looks very theistic. Mm. And it isn't theistic, it's non, non-dual. Yeah, so that's what I just said. I like the yeah. idea of it um, when you said about um, the elves as well, I think, because then everybody does it, no matter who you are, and it just keeps you humble. Mm. Yeah, that's, well, that's yes, it is, it is, yeah. Is that, does that intuition have a uh, story about if you meet the Buddha on the road, you should kill him? Which sounds very dramatic, but it's, it's basically saying you let go. That's when it's at. That's just another thing to let go of, ultimately. Sorry, to let go. <laughs> well, the point is that's just an impediment as well. You know, if you meet the, you know, get too attached to this Buddha, as about well, that's also just, you know, it's an impediment. It's just a sort of a formation that has happened. Don't actually. <laughs> well, the Tibetans sometimes say to create a bad connection with the master is better than, than to have no connection. Yeah. So, <laughs> 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 but 
but still better to create a good one if you can. <laughs> I think we can finish with five minutes of meditation, right? like before, just now that we have only five minutes, we can do 21 breaths, we can count 21 breaths and then just maintain the common biking state of mind until the end. <laughs> 